This week we begin work on an extremely important substantive area. As we examine contemporary theories and research on self, culture, and society in the contemporary world. Not least important is our backdrop goal of creating a digital identity in cyberspace. We begin this week with a central point. Culture is not something out there. It exists in the hearts and mind of individuals who differ in systematic ways. While interdisciplinary studies have become more and more pervasive in American college and universities, Nowhere is this interdisciplinary emphasis more important or central than in the domain of cultural studies. Thus, while your textbook is titled Sociology on Culture, this re represents among the most important interdisciplinary sources available. Culture of self and society focuses on two main themes, the triumph of the therapeutic and identity politics. This week, we look at the first half of the chapter the triumph of the therapeutic, which was set in motion during the late 20th century Death of God movement as post-war traditional society gave way to post-modernity and the me-decade of the 70s. Many cultural critics argued that the cultural transformations in which traditional values, often religious, were replaced by those emphasizing self-fulfillment had a price tag in terms of civic values, community, and society. Durkheim, a sociologist writing about France during the late 19th century, had observed a similar phenomena with modernization in terms of levels of social control and lower levels of social integration. For Durkheim, this resulted in individuals adrift, not knowing quite what to do. These very same themes were echoed in the works of David Reisman, author of The Lonely Crowd, and later Robert Bella and his colleagues in Habits of the Heart. Actually, Alex de Tocqueville, a French aristocrat, had earlier noted the individualistic tendencies in American society, which made the United States quite different, culturally speaking, from Europe, steeped as the latter was in tradition. However, Tocqueville noted two aspects of American society that mitigated against the destructive aspects of individualism, a convergence of self-interest and the collective interest, and voluntary associations. Max Weber, in fact, on his trip to America, also noted the significance of voluntary associations, such as churches, the PTA, Moose Lodges, Girl Scouts, for Weber, even religious affiliations, in creating civic and community involvement. More recently, Robert Putman has written a very important book in which he describes the breakdown of volunteerism and community group life in America, Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. Robert Bella, writing in the mid-1980s, notes a tradition of individualism in America that defines to a certain extent our national character if there is such a thing. We have traditions in biblical individualism, uh, the Protestant roots of America, but especially as represented by John Winthrop, the first governor of Massachusetts, Republican individualism as represented by Thomas Jefferson and his commitment to equality, utilitarian individualism as represented by Jeremy Bentham or Benjamin Franklin, the greatest good for the greatest number, or expressive individualism, as represented by Walt Whitman. The biblical and republican traditions, emphasizing self-reliance and independence, maintained a connection between the individual and collective sensibilities. However, Bella and his co-authors feared that utilitarianism could result in individuals looking out for number one without regard for the common good, and expressive individualism provided few reasons to make commitments to communities. A primary emphasis on self-reliance, argues Bella, has led to the notion of pure, undetermined freedom of choice, freedom of tradition, obligation, or commitment as the essence of the self. In turn, in the domain of love and marriage, 
This notion fuels the ascendancy of the therapeutic attitude, which has become much more widely diffused than the older notions of obligation and willingness to make sacrifices for others. In other words, the middle class mainstream sees the authentic self as the source of their standards and good relationships are based in self-knowledge, self-realization, and open and honest communication. The therapeutic perspective emerged in the late 19th and early 20th century, most notably in the work of Sigmund Freud. Most of you should have already taken a course in either sociology or psychology with Freud and psychoanalysis featured. Here, culture is viewed as inherently restrictive. It's part of the superego acting in opposition to the id or instinctual desires. Freud's ideas provided a theoretical framework for rebellion against these restrictions his talking cure for helping neurotics adjust laid the foundation for the therapeutic culture. The latter introduced a kind of permissiveness, the destruction of older notions of morality and authority. Freud viewed individual adjustments to the inherent antagonism between the demands of civilization and instinct, instinct, instinctual desires as a trade-off, resolved through an ego formation, a process that he later called the Oedipus Complex for boys based on identification with the father. The Triumph of the Therapeutic is the name of a book written in 1966 by Philip Reif. Reif claimed that modernity destroyed religious culture, which was based on rules, and replaced it with a therapeutic culture based on relationships. For Reif, the defeat of culture meant the defeat of traditional authority. He distinguishes cultures based on the degree to which they are replete with rules and proscriptions, maximalist, such as Orthodox Judaism, and minimalist, those with high levels of tolerance. Churches and parents no longer have the same authority. This reduces the level of guilt in individuals, but also the sense of direction Moreover, culture has traditionally provided symbolic forms for expressive, forbidden desires, such as rituals, art, and music. These, for Reif and Freud, are expressive and repressive at the same time. Modern culture no longer requires sacrifices of individual desire. Reif finally notes the ways in which the guardians of cultural traditions protect their culture through walls that separate the public and private worlds. Of course, this is also central to understanding elites and power. Christopher Lash agreed with Philip Reif in his belief that modern Western societies have dismantled the traditional culture of Victorian society and have replaced it with a minimalist culture of toleration. However, he viewed this as giving way to rampant narcissism. For Lash, the wide diffusion of the therapeutic culture, replete with its numerous self-help groups, is a symptom of the problem. The growth in narcissism is key to understanding the moral crisis in the contemporary United States. Lash defines narcissism and argues that this is not just an individual phenomena, but rather something expressed and supported more generally by American culture. The Bible Moralisé, an illustrated book of Bible stories, of course available only to a few elites during the medieval period, is an example of time-binding culture in which individuals are taught to connect their personal stories, their personal narr narratives, to long historical and glorified past. These were rare skills and there were not many copies of the Bible Moralisé to go around, but these connected cultural themes in the stained glass windows, windows of cathedrals, to individual narratives. A highly monolithic and monophonic culture 
lots of unity, which was great, so long as you were in the main camp. Modus vivendi is a space-binding medium. This is a painting, graffiti, a painting rendition of graffiti of a Saturday night rooftop party in which kids, in quotes, express themselves. The question, great expectations for Curtis? I have to ask the question.